Hello, I'm Robert, fact checker and science blogger and helping people scared of many things. I also have a bit of background in theology from my parents, my father, both my parents were missionaries. I am not a Christian anymore, but I have quite a lot of that background of Christianity that I can draw on. Because I was also interested in theology when I was a child and read a lot of my father's books. Anyway, so this is about how you can completely, just, just if you hear someone who predicts Jesus' return, tells you a date, then just ignore it. And it's just so sad the way these false prophets have made it seem that Jesus is a horrible person who's going to come and there's going to be great horrible things associated with his return. Because uh, for Christian, he's, he's their saviour. And... He's there to help when things are, are, are getting really bad as well. And the idea of Jesus' return is a kind of extension of that. And it, it shouldn't be something to be afraid of. And uh, it, there are various ways of looking at it, but for instance the Catholic Church thinks that Jesus returns when all the work of the Church is done in the world. So that's one way of looking at it. And uh, m most Christians would think and this is really quite far future because after all it's been 2,000 years and he hasn't returned. And back at the time of Jesus then the, his followers thought that he was going to return in their lifetimes. But that clearly didn't happen unless you are one of the Christians who look at this in a different way, according to which maybe it has already happened. In fact, maybe it's not even in time. And it's just, he's, uh, Jesus is always there for everyone. And maybe it's to do with that more than what, than what the other uh, kind of Christians, ways that Christians think about it. I mean, whatever the way you understand it, um, the Bible says quite clearly that nobody knows the day or the hour, neither the angels in heaven and the Son himself, that's Jesus, only the Father, that's God, knows the only, he's the only one who knows, according to the Bible. This means particularly that the people who wrote the Bible don't know. It means that God wouldn't have, left, wouldn't have kind of tried to influence the writers to leave hints, leave hints in the Bible. The people that the Bible was about, they, Jesus didn't know, the apostles didn't know, nobody knows. So the idea of going to the Bible to try and find a hint about this thing that God hasn't told anyone, it just, it doesn't make sense. It, it can't be there, there can't be any hints in the Bible, not if nobody knows. And the Bible says, therefore, don't be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Let the day's own trouble be sufficient for the day. So it's not really in the spirit of the Bible to be constantly worrying about when is Jesus going to return. It's more the idea of being ready, just every day in itself, then you're ready for whatever comes. And it's, it's much more in that kind of spirit than a future thing that you should be worrying about. And it should be something positive if you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, then you most likely don't believe in the resurrection. If you don't believe in Jesus' physical resurrection, then the idea of Jesus returning, uh, is, it doesn't really make sense, because that obviously is a physical return. That's how Christians think about it. So, un unless you're a Christian and believe in the resurrection, then if you don't believe in the resurrection, you don't believe in Jesus' return. Not in the sense that, that the people who take it literally mean. Then, that's not one of those ones about... So this is not saying don't plan. Of course plan and think about the future and so on. But it's about being anxious and constantly worried about What's, what's going to come next rather than dealing with things as, as you 
as you come up with as you have to, as they come to you and as you have to deal with them being caught up always in the future never in the present that's uh, you, you get pe people sometimes get into that they're never in the present they're always thinking two years ahead or ten years ahead or two weeks ahead and never really in the present and so the Bible is saying not not to do that to um, not to be anxious about tomorrow and then the Bible says very clearly that the, um, the love, love of God and they say that whoever loves has been born of God and knows God in other words it doesn't mean that, that you have to believe in God if you have that loving kindness then you've been born of God and you know God and you know, it doesn't matter if you don't actually if you don't actually even believe in God you're still, you still do it in the form of the loving kindness and in and this the love of God was made manifest in us because God is love and then um, and God sent his only son into the world so that he might, he might live through him and then this is love not that we have loved God but that he loved us and sent his son to, to be the propitiation of our sins and it says beloved if God so loved us we also ought to love one another no one has ever seen God if we love one another God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. And for Christian, for many Christians, and that means everyone, that God can abide in anyone, even if someone is a prisoner on death row, and they've committed horrific crimes, and they are, they're not, it's not wrongfully committed, but they actually did do something awful. And still, when they love others, then God is in them, God abides in them. So, uh, and this, this is why many Christians say that, that, that you just shouldn't have a death penalty. Another way of putting it is that, that can, can you give life to people when they've died? And of course you can't. So who are you to give death to them? Uh, so many Christians believe like that, especially like the Quakers, that's the one I was associated with. I never actually became a Quaker. They had very strong this idea of the love of God in everyone. Not just for not the Christians have love for everyone, but everyone has that has a potential inside them. They talk about that of God in everyone. It's how the Quakers think about that. And that's absolutely everyone. It doesn't matter what awful things they've done, they've still got that potential. And it, it, you can't get rid of it. That's how Chris how Quakers think about it. So the and so there isn't a puzzle or a game or a cryptic crossword for the date setters. I mean, if they wanted to give a date, they could have just said Jesus was plain speaking. If he wanted everyone to know that he's going to come back on the 1st of January 2001, he wouldn't have put a puzzle and, and said some puzzling things that if you kind of mix them together and you, cut, kind of, you, you take some of the words from some place and some from another and put them together and put them through a kind of mix or something, then eventually out pops the date. That's not, the, that's not the way the Bible works. And uh, instead he warns that nobody knows. And uh, the, also, it's absolutely clear that using the Bible for trying to prophesy things, it simply never works, trying to prophesy Jesus' return. People have done that for 2,000 years. And nowadays they do it a dozen times a year. And if, if, while well, there's so many people online, you can find some people who are doing it several times a week. There's one particular notorious uh, false prophet who does it several times a week, there's another one who does it just about as often. And uh, they, there's no method of predicting anything has ever had such a, a bad track record. And as I say there, that's not the fault of the Bible. The Bible says in no uncertain terms not to do this. It says the Bible itself says not to use the Bible in this way. And um, I've already read the first bit, but how nobody knows, so you can't possibly find it in the Bible. And then the whole idea about prophets, you get these people working on these incredibly complicated calculations. You get these pages and they use they use Daniel's prophecy in the Old Testament, which is 
the Old Testament law before Jesus, so I was at the point Jesus return, and then and they used various other things, and they um, and then they get you know, these pages, often with red and red text on it, and lots of capital letters, uh, both you know, just entire sentences of capital letters and that sort of thing, and often quite high, and a bit of nice strangers looking at the page, and with lots of numbers and. It doesn't really make a lot of sense, except presumably to the people who wrote it, it seemed to make sense. I think they're quite a bit like people who are manic depressive in their manic phase, and things seem to make sense. But what they're saying is not sensible. Their mind isn't functioning properly. And you, and then you get others who are just bullshitting, which means, technical term, I'm using that as a technical term, means they haven't got the eye on the truth at all, they're just trying to be impressive. Or they fancy themselves as a prophet. They don't really think much about what they what they're actually saying. And uh, but that is not how prophets work in the Bible. So uh, some Christians would believe there's such thing as true prophecy. But if there is, it's very rare. And in the Bible says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. So that pretty much costs out everyone who's a false prophet, the truth, the truth that we have to debunk in the in the group, there always comes out their own prophet's own interpretation of things. They always, always, I, I can't remember one I've debunked where it didn't come out of the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though humans, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so uh, these people just don't do that. They're not prophets, not in the Bible sense. And then the, um, I, I don't know what that particular one is, and then there's another thing. If you say in thine heart, in thine heart how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? Uh, and then when a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, the thing follow enough, nor come to pass, that is the thing the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, I shall not be afraid of him. In other words, if someone says that something is going to happen and it doesn't happen, then you know that that was not God, the Lord speaking, because the Lord never does that. And then again, so we have these perennial false prophets. They're just constantly producing these false prophecies, one after the week after another, after another. And, uh, or, and that includes if they have dreams, and they think the dreams are for God, and if the dream then says something that is false, then you know it's not God. And so you, you just shouldn't listen to these people. And so basically it's saying um, that, and then there's the whole thing about the trees. Watch out, false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but intimately they are ferocious wolves. And so they look uh, very kind of nice and pleasant on the outside. And they say, but, they're, but then they say these terrible things. And then they scare people. And they claim that's, that that's Christianity. And that is the wolves, the, the in, inwardly they're ferocious wolves. They just don't have their eye on trying to help people. The, the, the worst false prophets. And... Um, and by you, you recognise them by your fruit. You know, do you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In other words, you get to know that that you you recognise a thorn bush. You don't expect to pick grapes from it. You've got to know that that this thorn bush produces thorns, and you, uh, thistles produce thistles, and they don't produce figs. So it's quite a simple thing that you learn. You know, if you, if someone tells you to go off and pick some figs, you wouldn't go to a thistle bush. And so it's the same way. You recognise a false prophet. He is constantly producing thistles. So if he's constantly producing thistles, you don't go to him to try and get some figs. And so these false prophets, they're like that. So you try to get to know. It's, like, it's very much like the idea of recognising reliable sources. I mean, for every, anything. So just you've done many false prophets that constantly... And you get people who are constantly scared by the same false prophet. Time after time. The same false prophet makes a false prophecy. There's something about them, some kind of charisma or something, 
that is that makes them seem convincing. And this person gets very scared, nothing happens, and then this false prophet makes another prophet see the very same false prophet, and then they get scared again. Nothing happens, and the cycle goes on and on and on like that. Some people are like that for weeks and months, constantly scared by the same false prophet. So if that they haven't really learned this lesson that you should uh, you should learn to recognise that a uh, um, that figs don't come from thistles and grapes don't come from thorn bushes. So that's basically a thing you, you need to try and learn. And generally, the um, the, the people, maybe if within their own culture it's okay, these people with the dreams of Jesus coming, especially young children and so on. And for them it's very positive. But the way it's presented on YouTube, the way it's used by other people, and the way it's taken seriously, then um, basically I wouldn't listen to any of the predictions by people in the Bible about where they start saying Jesus is going to return. They've just basically brought up from a child to constantly say that Jesus is going to return. And they, they, they're never right. No, not one of them has ever been right, obviously. And so this is like, I could think you should have really find this the whole cut category of people to go online on YouTube and give their dreams or their, um, or their whatever the reasoning and then say Jesus is going to return on such and such a date. It's the same thing, like if you imagine that, uh, so so they'll, you get this post prophet and you say, it's going to come on this day and then nothing happens, and often they, without even making it, in the next sentence they don't even pay attention to the post prophecy they did yesterday and they just go on and say, it's really going to come today, it's going to come today, yes, definitely, it's going to be today, or tomorrow, whatever, and then, it's definitely going to be tomorrow, and then you get people thinking, well, the more false, he's made so many false prophecies, so surely he's going to be right next time, and so you, and you get them sort of saying, this time it really is right, I know I've done it wrong, I know I've got it wrong a hundred times, but this time I know for sure this is it, and you get people just follow them, it goes on and on and on, and on and on, it's the hundredth time, it's definitely going to return. When I say it a hundred times, the hundredth time is the time it's definitely going to return. Then it doesn't happen, it can't return and say, well, it's going to be the hundred one time. I say with absolute certainty, at the hundred and one false prophecy, well, my hundred one prophecy of Jesus' return is definitely going to happen. And then, no, my hundred and second prophecy of Jesus, it's definitely going to happen this time. And th they just go on and on and on, and in their 80s or 90s, and then eventually they die. And uh, over time, wait how long they live. And you do get false prophecy prophets who can be, just keep on prophesying on and on, on throughout their life. And uh, so, I, I don't know, it's, it's very hard to get into the mindset of understanding why they do this and why they don't recognize uh, that they're not really quite. Uh, that, that, that they don't aren't really prophets. They just fancy themselves as prophets and they, they don't seem to be able to recognise that they aren't. Even when they keep failing. Over and 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 on and then ten years later, after failing every, every nearly every week, they still think they're a prophet. And so imagine if someone came to you and said, There's going to be a hailstorm tomorrow and it's going to be hailstones as big as hen's eggs, or as big as, uh, even bigger, you know, as big as footballs. And nothing happens. And then they say, definitely tomorrow there's going to be a hailstorm, and it's going to be hailstones as big as, as uh, footballs. And again, nothing happens. A hundred days later, well, I, I got all those dates wrong, but this time definitely, absolute certainty, a hundredth time, I made so many mistakes, I must get it right this time. You can't help but get better by continually trying to prophesy the same thing. And again, no, no, no footballs, no uh, hailstones the size of footballs fall out of the sky. And they, they don't make things happen by doing all these false prophecies. And doing lots of false prophecy doesn't make you, it's not something you learn by and get better by getting it wrong. It's not like riding a bicycle where constantly pulling off the bicycle and eventually you learn to ride it. But if you constantly do these false prophecies, you don't eventually um, get to the point where you're actually telling the truth, or actually um, prophesying. It just doesn't work like that. 
just constantly, constantly go on and on all your life making false prophecies, like the person who thinks that they can predict hailstones. It doesn't matter how many times they make that mistake. They're not going to become better at predicting hailstones, not if they just do it like that. If they learn a bit about meteorology and then how to forecast the weather, and they, and they become a weather forecaster, then they can predict rain, sunshine, hailstones, whatever. But uh, that's science. But these, are, these people aren't doing anything like that. They're just, there's no way really to learn. And yeah, now I suppose he did it using calculations from the Bible, so he does some complicated calculations and deduces from that that he would have a hailstone falling tomorrow. And you know, if, if you, it, it wouldn't make any difference with how he said he was, he was doing it. So, um, yes, yeah, so I talked about that. And the traditional view is that uh, that the that immediately before the second coming, then God would announce it. But we wouldn't be by him speaking to some false prophet or YouTube channel owner. So that's this um, this thing from Amos. That, that's God, not Jesus. And then you have these people here, mysterious hum, and that is not the same as angels with seven trumpets proclaiming it throughout the world. But uh, you, 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 I shouldn't actually have to believe it and take these things literally as a, um, as a Christian. And then you need, need to. Uh, there's no if there's nothing physical in the physical world, no scientific reason for anything to happen. And you don't have to uh, kind of, uh, what's it, just ignore the say science and just say, well, I'm a Christian so I can't follow science. So there are quite a lot of Christians who just think that Christianity is not in any way incompatible with science. They might believe that there were miracle, miracle, Jesus did show miracles, but they don't, you don't necessarily need to believe that either. And um, so if, if you like that, then there's nothing yet scientifically that is a risk to the entire world. So that sort of thing is not going to be happening anytime soon. And then if you go back to the time, of, remember that Jesus was going to return within in the actual lifetimes of the people at the time of Jesus and uh, they, they, if you ask them back then, if you could go back and interview uh, Jesus' followers then they were expecting him to return not long after he died and he was in, in, in within that very generation and he didn't so he so that means that we're now 2,000 years later on so why would he why would he return exactly 2,000 two thousand years later on, roughly two thousand years later on. If he hasn't returned by this point, then what about hundred thousand years from now? Another two thousand years or hundred thousand years from now? There's nothing special about this time. So I think most Christians would, would think would take one or other of those views. Either that it's not actually something that's, uh, that's actually going to happen in that literal sense at all and you take it in a, a different way and be fair as different ways you can take it as symbolic you order to see the teachings and uh, Jesus in your heart and things like that or it's how uh, it's about what happens when you die or something like that and you can look at many ways of looking at it or else think of it as being that you need to be ready for Jesus' return at any moment. That means leading a life that's very positive and you're doing what you can with, with the life that you've been given. 
and then and then sometime in the way way distant future then you could imagine that at some point it's going to happen and if you are a Catholic then Catholics think of Jesus returning when the work of the church is completed and specifically they think and it's not they're trying to convert they're not trying to convert Jews or Muslims um, and it's specifically Jews but they think that Jesus is uh, return has been suspended until all everyone in Israel recognizes Jesus and that would mean before if, as long as the Jews live in Israel who are not Christian then it's pretty clear that Catholics think that Jesus is not going to return yet so they have this idea that Jesus could return at any moment so then you still have that feeling being ready for Jesus' return. But then his return is suspended because the uh, the Jews haven't all become Christian. So, and that's not like it can happen for a long, long time into the future. So, in that sense, and Catholics think of it, if you follow catechism, then it would be a very distant future thing. It's not, not likely to happen in any time in the near future. So you can have lots of different views on this, and but really, it's remember to consider the lilies, and none of this really matters. If you're living a good Christian life in the present, it really doesn't matter what your views are about when Jesus is going to return. You'd be you'd be ready if he did return, you know, um, but you you but you don't really expect it, and it, or you or you're sort of expectant but not if you feel know to I me, mean. you're you're not. Not in the sense that you lay around and don't do anything. And uh, Paul the Apostle made a, made a very clear speech about that, saying not to just lay around and expect Jesus to return. That's not the Christian way of doing things. So you just lead your life as you would. It doesn't change how you lead your life except that you're ready at any point. And you just uh, you plan for the future live with uh, and you know, just live a normal life just like anyone else would and then the thought of Jesus returning at some point in the world maybe in the future maybe far future in future generations is something positive that you that you also can have in the background in your life it's never scary not if you're not if you're a Christian you follow a Christian path so um but theologians, so it's basically radical to some Christians, but not to theologians. Many theologians treat the prophecy in the Bible as a literary device. The prophecy of Daniel, for instance, is a piece of history of events that happened before the prophecy. And even the second coming for some of them is either history or it's not in time. As I said, I explained about Catholics and all that. And in, in any case, it's not the central message. It's more in the Bible, if you do believe in prophecy, the prophecy is more to do with the framing of it. The background story about how the events came to place. And they say, for instance, Jesus was prophesied. And so he's fulfilling a, a, like a plan or a, a, a kind of pattern which led to Jesus uh, being being born at that particular time. And so that's the sense in which the prophecy is more, it's not the central point in the Bible, it's more the kind of framing. And the central message for many Christians are uh, teaching of being compassionate, generous, considerate, wise, loving kindness. That's the central message of the Bible. And as I said at the beginning, it's not really um, believing in Jesus that's the central thing. Jesus is like the support as well. The central thing is the love and the kindness. That's the central thing. That is that is God in you. And that's how uh, Quakers used to think about it. Quakers think about it. And if you, I read that passage about how God is love and then how if you if you have love in yourself then that's God in you. So uh, so that would be the central point of the Bible for many Christians and the rest is framing and helping you to understand giving it context 
giving it an external meaning to uh, to help help with that. So yes, so I'm not saying I'm not if for, for those of you who I say I'm not trying to trash your belief if you believe in the near future end of the world. I'm saying this to people who get scared by all this. Not to the people who for whom it's a positive support. And you'll be in a community of Christians who find a positive message. So please don't think I'm please bear in mind I'm doing this because of false prophets and I'm doing this to help people who are very scared by these false prophets who make Jesus seem like he's something scary and horrible when he isn't. And, and so if you are a Christian, then Jesus' is support for you, Jesus returning is something very positive for you. If you are not Christian, most likely you don't believe in the resurrection. If you don't believe in the resurrection, then you may, might well think that the Christian teachings are very inspiring. But you would not believe that Jesus can return in a physical sense. So in that sense, you, the, the teachings about the second coming are not for you, because you just don't believe that, that is possible. You don't believe that, that Jesus returns in a physical sense. So most non-Christians would be in that would, would be in that category. That they they, 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 they find it rather incredible. They don't believe that that Jesus did return or could return in a physical sense. So if you're like that, then Jesus return. And again, you just you just won't believe it. As long you don't have to. You can still, uh, because again, I, I would say that although, in terms of, you know, the resurrection is quite central to Christianity. Uh, in a, in a way. But how exactly you understand that is maybe not quite so central. And the really important message is that both the uh, teachings about love and the teaching of the support that comes the idea of Jesus and his crucifixion and his resurrection that he went through that. And the resurrection is most meaningful for the crucifixion for many Christians. And that's the kind of the support that someone has gone through all the uh, taking on and experiencing all the suffering and then that is something that then and then that then becomes a very positive thing that helps you to work with the sometimes very difficult terrible situations you might find yourself in and then that's the sense in which resurrection is the idea that someone's gone through all that and then came out and it took it all on. So that can be quite positive for, for Christians as well. And it, does, it doesn't really matter too much how literally you, you think of that. It's more the central message than what actually physically happened 2,000 years ago. So that's the sense in which for some Christians, very theologically minded, then the centrality of actual physical resurrection may not be so important to them, but the actual concept behind it is very important to them. But how exactly you understand that physically may be less important. So, uh, and th th so these are different views about the book of Revelation. So some say it be understood in the context of its own time, and some that only a portion of it has occurred now that it's best understood spiritually and then there's the idea that it's prophetic and that the literal I'm getting in the future is the fourth of those ways so yes I'd just like to talk a little bit about the uh, nature of the idea of an antichrist first of all and the idea of the beast so uh, an antichrist itself in the bible is there's not a single antichrist it's often in plural, and um, many. The, so, so the the Antichrist is is not really so central for most aspects of Christianity. And and then the beast in the Book of Revelation, not necessarily is the Antichrist anyway, or Antichrist. And the um, so you get these people saying that especially like worrying about the COVID-19 vaccine 
and saying, oh, I think this vaccine is, uh, has been sent to us. It's, it's been produced by the beast. And the beast is this kind of going to be opposed, is opposed to Jesus, so I should avoid the vaccine. Something like that. Well, the book of Revelation has absolutely nothing, of course, it's not long before vaccines, but uh, not, not only that, um, it just doesn't fit any of these things that people try to interpret as being the beast. There were four beasts, and the first, and there's the first beast, and the second beast, who makes an image of the first beast, beast and brings it to life, and then gets gets uh, everyone to worship the first beast. And this is the second beast, the same one that we stood with Mark of the first beast as well. And the um, so the, there has to be an element of worship. If you think if you think this passage does apply today, then and what's more, the second beast kills everyone who doesn't worship the first beast, the image of the first beast. Now, whatever that might mean, it's a very enigmatic passage, but uh, there's nothing, we don't have that element of worship in modern government. We don't have that idea of a ruler who has to be worshipped, which is the basic concept behind this passage. Even uh, Xi Jinping or uh, or Putin, nobody worships them, and uh, certainly presidents, nobody worships the president. These all, and, and the uh, you you wouldn't really say that people worship the Pope either, not really. And in any case, uh, and and um, I suppose the. New, I think the newest is Kim Jong-un, but he's not got a plan to bring peace to the entire world, which is what the peace is supposed to do. And he, he's, um, it's more that he's treated as a divine leader, because he's the, the head of the Confucian idea about a divine, trying the, what he's trying to do, which seems very extraordinary to us, we're not in the mindset, but the way the North Koreans think about it is they're trying to create a heaven on earth. And they think of Kim Jong-un as being a divine. And they have a mythology, mythology about the past of North Korea. And the divine appearance of the first ruler centuries ago. And then they think he's in the same lineage. And there's a certain divinity to him. And so I know that seems extraordinary to us. But... You know, that's how they think. And then his aim is to reunify North and South Korea. And that also is the aim of South Korea. They also are Confucian. They also want to reunify with North Korea. Of course don't agree with his politics, don't agree with his human rights record. But they do want to reunify the two people. And so looking for a future Confucian democracy, democ 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 democracy, but what's going to happen to King Jong-un? and his lineage, I don't know. But uh, that is, that's the sort of thing he's thinking about. Now that's not the Antichrist, because he isn't trying to bring, bring about, um, he isn't trying to bring out peace in the entire world. He does want to bring about peace in Korea. And um, but he, that their, their focus is completely limited, uh, focused to uh, Korea. And um, and, and it's not really, it doesn't really match the Christian idea either. So, um, really, it, this passage is very enigmatic, and most Christians, I think, are, you know, of course there are people who try to apply to the present, and maybe very popular, for instance, in the Bible Belt US, but it's very hard to see how it does apply. It definitely doesn't apply to Bill, to a vaccine. Bill Gates doesn't want you to worship him. And no one's going to kill you if you don't worship Bill Gates. Indeed, they just laugh at you if you did. And it's the same with uh, any, any of these president things as well. There's n not even the slightest element of worship. And there can't be compulsory worship. And that's the whole idea of the beast. It's compulsory worship. And that simply just doesn't occur. 
in, in, in most of the present day world. So, uh, there's nothing really, it's, it really just doesn't apply to our present day world. So, some people have interpreted that as meaning, because we're just not into worship in the way they were back then, when they did worship emperors. So, uh, that's why people think, some people think that it's the, maybe it was the, about the Roman emperors, which, because they did have an element of emperor worship. And then there was the Emperor Nero, and that was about the time that the Book of Revelation was written. And the number 616 is associated, which was the original number, is associated with Nero. And they, they think also that the, maybe it was referring to the coins, the Roman coins. And so a number of things that bring it together that may be just possibly. So the Book of Revelation, though it's very enigmatic to us now, it wouldn't necessarily have been enigmatic back then, in the same way. These probably were very familiar images that the Christians at the time would have understood. But we've lost that knowledge, because it's a long, long time, many centuries. And however they understood the Book of Revelation, then we are basically guessing at what would have quite probably been quite plain to them, and not, not as difficult to interpret as it seems to us. And they might well have interpreted it as being about Emperor Nero. That's just one hypothesis. And um, in, in any case, so th that book is very enigmatic. And in the Eastern Orthodox Church, they actually it's not included in the lectionary. You can't teach from the pulpit from the Book of Revelation because it's regarded as being too easily misunderstood and misinterpreted and too easily confused and they they were, they were very late in actually accepting it as in the canon at all it was the, the last, one of the last books I think it was the last book to be added to the Bible and it's the lot of books that never were added the Apocrypha and these are books that various people have thought should in some way be added to the Bible but they were never accepted and the book of Revelation was, but it was very late, it was accepted. So again, the early Christians, time of Jesus, they wouldn't have read the book of Revelation, it didn't exist yet. So, and, and then, and Christianity evolves. I, maybe if I talk about the rapture another time, the idea of the rapture is a new idea. Christians at the time of Jesus would not have recognised it. And that's not necessarily mean it's wrong, but it's important to realise that it's not the Christian, not first century Christianity. And um, it developed in the 19th century. And it's basically a new version of Christianity, a new religion, a new development. But an awful lot of the Christianity isn't static, and nor is Judaism. So the early, the, the actually get the beliefs changing between the start of the Old Testament at the end of the Old Testament, it's not the same belief system. And you can actually continue it back to before the start of the Old Testament, back to like the Epic of Gilgamesh, back to the Sumerian times, and the Great Flood goes back there. So uh, if you're kind of more scholarly in, in your approach to this, you don't see it as a single belief system, as a particular snapshot in time that was Judaism. It just gradually evolved over many centuries and thousands of years. And Christianity is also evolving, and people's interpretation and understanding of Christianity is gradually evolving and is continuing, continuing to evolve today. And so we do, you don't really go back then, and you go back to the Bible, and you find lots of things that are quite archaic. And things, I like passages about slavery, for instance, and you know, various other passages that are just about the, the that they they come from that past they you don't have to say well okay back then that's how they're saying that's what the laws they had and so on therefore all Christians should follow that it's not like that the whole thing is evolving just like the history of civilization then there's the history of, of the religious beliefs in the Bible and and so there's that's the kind of historical perspective there's, there's no doubt about it can't be questioned really that the, uh, the very early uh, 
um, Jews had a very different view of beliefs on many things compared to with later on in the Old Testament. And then you go through to the Bible and if you go to the Gospels, later on to the book of Revelation and you have, for instance, and the two Thessalonians where Apostle Paul introduces the idea of the resurrection, not the resurrection of the, um, what's it called, the, the, when people, the, well, about this, what's it called, the uh, resurrection of the dead. Is it called the resurrection of the dead? I don't know, what is the word for it? My mind goes blank sometimes. Um, not the resurrection of the dead, but if I put that in. I'm lost the word. Um, the resurrection of the dead. Anyway, you, you know what I mean. That goes back to two Thessalonians. Oh yes, I, I think you do, I, I got it right. It is resurrection of the dead. Yes, I, I don't know, I've just got a bit of a glitch in my thinking then. Anyway, yes, so uh, that, that's the, that was the idea was introduced in the by possible Paul isn't in the Gospels. So that's an evolution of ideas already. And maybe Jesus did teach that, but you know it, it's not in it's not in the teachings until after long after him. The very few actual words of Jesus, if you go back to the Bible. And then uh, so if if you think about the uh, Bible as being more historical than that, then you have a kind of softer approach to it all less way, less hard line and it doesn't mean it's wishy-washy but it's just that you you don't feel you're not so tied and it's more kind of really putting it to putting the teachings it's really about putting the teachings of the bible in into the place into into your everyday life and that's where it's at rather than like than going back to the bible and saying you know everything was sorted out back two thousand years ago and the whole thing is set in stone and it's all crisply de demarked I've got to know every single sentence in the Bible and live my life according to that sentence it's more like it's something that has to continually change depending on every situation you're in and depending so it's much more a living thing so it's the living word you talk about the living word of the Bible it's not a fossil so if you have the idea that the Bible is a fossil and at that particular time it got fossilized uh, in, the, in the first century AD and you've got to live as if this was the first century AD and as if everything and without, as if technology was no longer existed or whatever and that's not really and most Christians don't think of it as being a fossil and think of it as being a living religion and that it's insp the inspiration goes back there you're constantly going back with inspiration but you don't have to think that you uh, that you you've got to think about, about a, something that's got to continually reinvent itself and re become refreshing over and over again. Continually refresh itself without losing that connection back to the first century. And so that would be how many Christians would think about Christianity today as a very much a living religion where things aren't completely set. And you have to work through things and try to understand things and work with things in your life. So if you have that background, then these people again will go back to the Bible and they say, well, you know, I had up the number of letters in this, in this sentence and this is going to tell me what's going to happen in the future. That's completely different. You know, that's, it just doesn't, it's not, not the way most, it's not the way Christianity is going for most people these days, I would say, except for some very fundamentalist people. And, I, and I'm, uh, even then, I mean, very few people would say, would take the Bible so literally, that they think that the sky is hard and blue like lapis lazuli, and that the angels have their, um, have their, their cisterns on top of the sky and they throw it out full of snow and full of rain. You know, that's in the Bible, but you don't take that literally. So, um, we, and... You, know, you don't say the Bible, the world has to be flat because the early uh, Bible descriptions look sound like a flat earth. So it's, it's like that. 
and so this, so if you if you do it like that, then you'll be less tied, you'll be less vulnerable to these people who are trying to tell you. Because if you if it's a living word and you're living it in your own life, then it's much less that people somebody else is going to say, well, you know, this is what it really means, because you're finding out for yourself what it really means. And so, of course, you listen and you listen to what you've been taught about it but then you try and apply it in your life and if it's a living religion it's actually for because for a true Christian then Christianity actually literally fulfills their entire life not in the sense that they're following a little rule book all the time it just infuses their life it just it just goes through it all and it, not in a difficult way there's a support there's something very easy and it, it, it lifts, up, uplifts them. It's uplifting religion. If you if you really are following Christianity, and you follow Christianity in, in what many people think nowadays, like modern theologians, how they think about Christianity, something very positive and uplifting that goes all infuses through your entire life, infuses out to other people. They don't have to be Christian, and it's something that works with anyone of any religion. And they can be like your family, even if they're completely different religions. And that's still the work of God and, and the love of God. That's the way you see about it. And that's the teaching of Jesus, even though it's someone else's religion. And even if it's not your ideas at all. So that is how it's possible, for instance, for a Christian Catholic nun, I think she was Catholic, to become a Zen priest. And the Zen uh, 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 regarded as someone who's, who's uh, has got the, the has seen has seen so sort of awakened to seen something, and is able to teach others uh, others the practices of Zen Buddhism. She was really a quite high teacher in the in the Zen in Zen Buddhism as well as in the Catholic religion. Um, she's a Catholic, a Catholic nun, and you don't have those if you're really following the way living. Um, the living Bible, then you don't have those sharp divisions. And people, some people get very puzzled. They think, how can a uh, sister, whatever her name is, Catholic, Roshi, Nun, let's look up her name. And they think, well, how can that be? That doesn't make sense. And some people, it's just um, her sister, and that's not her, Catholic, Roshi, her sister, um, what's her name, her name, was it? Yeah, Zen Catholic, that's Sister Elaine McInnes. So she is a good example of someone who is living Christianity and Catholicism, and she's also living Zen Buddhism at the same time. And she sees no contradiction between the two. And so people with a very fluid mind and who are living the religions they're doing, it fuses their entire life. They're living Christianity and living Zen Buddhism and if that's very, very going all the way through your being and sometimes you might actually see that there's any contradiction it's, it's, the, it's all just it's in your being, both of them so, uh, so that's also something to bear in mind it can help you to be more open-minded sometimes to people of other religions when you realise and that, and that basically is that passage that went back to the beginning that if you think like this and if you, that's the essence and if all the rest is just a kind of support for it you know this bit about no one, no one has ever seen God if we love one another God abides in us and his love is perfected in us and uh, anyone that does not know love does not know God and whoever, uh, whoever loves has been born of God knows God even if they not even believing in God but uh, in, in, in the formal sense not subscribing to religion that has God in it so, um, so, so, so anyway so hopefully this helps some of you who got scared in, in, in the group main thing so it's mainly to help people with, with um, who get scared by these appalling false prophets and, uh, and, and you, know, you should uh, feel Compassion, if you've got this loving kindness, 
doesn't mean a kind of split off loving kindness, that you're kind and loving kind to everyone except in the name of false prophet. So you should have the same kindness towards the false prophets if you can possibly manage it. Which is really quite difficult to do when they've made you suicidal. But uh, I, but I mean that's it. You're really you're much freer in the world if you don't kind of bear grudges and keep the grudges and just think, you know, I mean this person made me suicidal. It's really I'm I'm very upset. I've been so had such a bad impact on my life. And you know I've been I've been trying to, I've tried to kill myself because of what he said. And I've um, you know you say you know, I've actually got everything ready and I was about to do it or even try, I even did attempt it and you you, know, you might say and, and you know, you've been uh, yeah, numerous uh, panic attacks, heart racing, vomiting with anxiety because of his false prophecy. So it's quite difficult in that situation to have this kind of loving kindness but that is basically the message of Christianity if you want to follow that Christian path. And you just to kind of rather than you know, you're not being good, not going to be able to do it really, but to work towards that and just to think that you know, uh, not not particularly not try to reinforce the grudges, but just recognise that you know they they all are God's children, and and try and and you just hope that some way he finds a path, he or she the false prophet, you know that they find a path into. What, what I into kind of reconciliation going forward and, and finding the love of Jesus in, in their own heart and that that can help transform them as well and even if there's no sign of that ever happening you can certainly have that wish in your own heart that wish for them to be transformed it's something transformative in yourself and helps you to have a much softer open attitude to the world if even, if like so even you're debunking and you're telling everyone that what they're saying is completely mistaken but you've still got this idea that they're God's children too and so have that in the back of your mind even if you're not actually even if you're saying that you're there they're, they're, they're a crackpot or whatever or that the ideas are crackpot it's better to talk about the ideas if possible but still try to keep that if you, if you possibly can and that's quite a good good thing as well and, and then you can, and so you can just, you can completely ignore any date setting. It's not in the Bible. There are no dates in the Bible. And the Bible does not support this. Oh, and I should just, oh yes, I'll just say one more thing, and then I'll stop. So, you often get these dates from the uh, uh, Jewish rabbis. And the Jewish rabbis, they... They, then it's very different from Christianity. Remember that they don't recognize Jesus at all. And they, they don't think Jesus was their Messiah because he didn't bring peace to the entire world, which is what they think happens. Whereas Christians think about it in a slightly different way, but the same, same basic background. So and they are waiting for their Messiah. They're still there, still waiting. So the, all the things about Jesus' return don't apply to the to the Jews. So there's there's no there's, there's nothing telling them that they can't prophesy their Messiah. And so when Jews prophesy, they're not they're not doing going against their Bible, which stops at the end of the Old Testament, along with lots of other uh, things that we don't have in the Christian, or what you don't have, Christians don't have. And so then, uh, some rabbis especially think it's very positive to constantly uh, prophesy that their Messiah is going to come. But they don't really think about it in quite the same way as not the, the prophesy, prophecy like that. But they, but to continue to have this, this absurdity of hope that and, and belief that their that their uh, Messiah is going to return next week, next month, or whatever. And they can constantly say that and think that, and um, they and then it doesn't come, but they just keep on for another month, another month, and so on. In that, in if we put uh, in that particular tradition, you know, in traditions like that, 
and it's very positive and not against their scriptures to uh, keep saying that uh, their Messiah is going to come. Now, this Messiah, ah oh yes, so I was talking about Antichrist, so I make a connection with Antichrist. So uh, you get these people saying that these prophecies of the rabbis, actually they're the Antichrist. But I don't think that fits. I, I don't think that's what that passage was about in, in, in the book of Revelation. It's most likely about the Roman emperors, and not about the Jewish Messiah, because they would have thought that Jesus was the Messiah. And so, the, so but when uh, the Jewish rabbis, when they prophesy their Messiah, they're thinking about the future where there's going to be peace throughout the world, yes. But they're not thinking about a ruler of the entire world. They're not thinking about the, their Messiah subjugating the world and not requiring everyone to worship him. The, uh, for the Jews, their Messiah is not like the Christian Messiah. The Jewish Messiah is much more the Messiah of the Jewish people. And so do correct me if you know more about this and I've got anything wrong, if I understand it right. So their uh, vision for the future when their Messiah arises is a future in which Jesus gives them a direct connection to God and uh, not Jesus, the Messiah does. And he brings about peace to the entire world. And there's a huge amount of respect for the Jews and gifts coming around from around the world because of all the positive things they're doing to benefit the entire world. And so they think, and so they think about that. And um, of course, Israel does all sorts of things that people find very upsetting nowadays. Uh, so you know, it's, it's difficult to but it's, it can be maybe quite, especially if you're Palestinian or something, you might you might find this a little bit difficult, challenging. But the um, but that's that's how they're thinking about their Messiah, and the um, they they think of the Messiah as being complete peace throughout the entire world. But they think of that not as being that their Messiah rules the entire world, not not like a ruler. The MSI is the Messiah for, for, for the Jews. And he's like a leader and uh, you know, someone who's bringing, bringing back their... their he's, he's, he's not even... And not the Muslim Messiah, it's the first Messiah. And the only Messiah in their religion. It's not that he came back. So it's actually quite, quite difficult again to see how that could actually happen. You could have a real world person who could fulfill all the different ideas of all the different branches of Judaism and bring them all together. That would be a huge challenge anyway. Uh, never mind everything else. But uh, but that's what they believe. And so when you get these uh, these prophecies of the Jewish Messiahs, they're prophesying a very peaceful future and they're not thinking it's not they, I think it's completely wrong to co connect that with the Christian idea of an Antichrist. I think I, that's, that's not the Jewish Messiah. So I think that's quite important because you get some Christians who do that. So it's so you get these endless um, prophecies of the Jewish Messiah, but it's nothing to do with the idea of an Antichrist. And it's very positive for them to to uh, prophesy this because they're thinking about a peaceful future. Most the different ideas about their, their Messiah, but that's the definite, definite idea is it peaceful, maybe totally peaceful, or maybe there's some uh, element of something having to be um, um, to vanquished in some way, and then their Messiah. But it's not the idea of a kind of world war, or anything like that. And um, and, and, the, and there's a possibility of their Messiah, the two kinds of Messiah, and the one could be totally peaceful. And I don't know which of the two it would be. If you look at the Jewish Jewish um, teachings on it, and uh, anyway, anyway, so that's uh, that's just to help people who think this work again. It's pretty obvious. It's not. It's it's not going to be anything like the ideas in the Book of Revelation. I don't think you can think of that as being in any way connected with the Jewish idea of a Messiah. I'm sure that people who wrote the Book of Revelation would not have thought it would be anything to do with the Jewish idea of a Messiah. Because, as I said, they thought 
that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. And um, anyway, anyway, so I hope this has helped help deal with a few things and a few things that have scared people. And the main thing is, and I think you know, this, this, this very positive thing, that Jesus, Jesus, the idea of Jesus as a savior is something very positive. It's to do with being kind, it's to do with being generous and uh, compassionate, helping other people, you know, leading a positive life. And if you're doing any of that, then you are following Jesus and God. It doesn't matter even if you're not Christian. Then you're following the central message, which is the central message in, in all the religions, really. And so, and so again, you know, if you, you get people saying, "Oh well, you know, if you if you go and scratch your ear three times, you go to hell or something," and that's not really that's a very uh, kind of comic book idea, and that's not really what Christianity is about. Yes, I think it would be very few, not many theologians who would who would believe that this little that this, it works like that. So anyway, anyway, hope, hopefully this uh, helps some of you in the group because I've I've been specifically a, a, a answering through this talk. I've been specifically answering various things in our Doomsday Debunk group that come up over and over and over again. And so hopefully it's helped help some of you who've been scared to to maybe find a different a different eye on, on some of these things. And so I'll stop there and any questions then you know do do what you ask and uh, um, do do come and help join the group, to help in the group if you if you if you are that I'm scared, then maybe the people here can help you. And if you can help people, then we, we, I mean, we welcome good theologians who are having a good, strong background in theology. To, uh, to because we get so many, get so many of these false prophets. Well, I think most of them, many of them, don't even have a clue. They've not, not never really studied theology, not properly, or they study the Bible and then they just they just they have a very blinkered view. I think that's how false prophets do it. They sort of look at, I look at this this passage, this one, that's it. And you see something else, that's not quite right, no, I don't go there. I've made bit, no, no, forget about that bit of the Bible. That's the bit I've got to look at. No, no, forget about that. That's, that's basically how the false prophets go. Yeah. It's, it's quite an understandable human reaction. But anyway, but you, so again, again, so do do try and have some feeling of kindness towards the false prophets if you can, uh, however difficult it must be for you. And uh, right, I'll stop that, and I'll, I'll have to.